I guess that clock's working, but it's just not right. It's right right twice a day. See, if it was right right now at 7, we would be, or what time is it? 8. If it was almost 8, we would almost be done. Okay, <clears throat> continuing, our, continuing our study uh, with the book Aubrey Johnson wrote, The Spiritual Patriots, talking about the, the book of Jude. And uh, to start this evening, I just want to read the book of Jude, the, the first 11 verses. So if you want to turn to Jude, uh, we'll read the first 11 verses. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels did not keep their power domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. <clears throat> but these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to look at verse 11, <clears throat> the first section of verse 11, where it talks about the way of Cain. Um, and we'll look at, and next week, um, in the following weeks, the other two that he mentions there. But to start, what uh, Aubrey puts here in his book, he says, the, 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 this lesson is, is titled, A Road Less Traveled. And, we're gonna, and he says, if, you, if you're to know victory, if I am to know victory, I must choose my path carefully. So when we look at what Aubrey's been doing in the book, it's dealing with warfare, and spiritual patriots, and we talked about what patriots are and how we reference it here. <clears throat> and what he refers, what he talks about, how he starts this chapter, he talks about during times of war, retreating forces would often swap road signs indicating the names of streets or the directions of particular cities. The aim is to confuse the enemy and slow his advance. With a good map and a compass, it's easy to sort things out and identify the correct route. Careless travelers, however, can be led astray by their inattention. Now, I thought about that. I don't know when the last time I referred to a map um, where I really looked at road signs and street signs because now, with this little tool we have here, I can just say, take me to Alkai Road Church of Christ, and then it will direct me to Alkai Road Church of Christ. It'll tell me which way to turn. It'll tell me what to do and how to get there. And... I've learned to rely on that, and I, there might be shorter paths, but I just, whatever GPS tells me, that's pretty much what I do. But and if you, he referenced the time of war, but I think I can remember more probably cartoons where you'll see somebody will turn a sign, uh, if it's a, in the event of a race or something, where it will take people off course. And then what he refers to is he says, woe means woe. So W-O-E means W-H-O-A, whoa. And he says that Satan delights in luring unsuspecting souls down avenues leading away from God. So if you think about most Christians, and that's what we're talking about here, this, is, this book is Jude is written to Christians, and how we defend the faith. Most Christians start off, do they not, 
with the intent they want to go to heaven. I mean, they're, they're, when they come up out of the water, they're, they're babes in Christ, they're fresh, and, and most new Christians probably are excited, and the, their, their path, I mean, they're, they're, they're toned in, they're going to go, but then, somehow they just get a little taken off path, don't they? I mean, we do as Christians, we, we all sin, so we all somehow get off the right path. Now, we can get back on the path, and, and we should do that, and we do that through sin and, and confession, and, but as humans, and Satan, with the job that Satan does, he puts things as, as um, detractors, and we take detours. And so when we think about, as Christians, uh, a road less traveled, that's really what the Christian path is. It is less traveled. We look at the world we live in today, and we've talked about the, the scripture so many times about the way that leads to destruction and the way that leads to heaven and, and the, the two different paths, and they're, they're totally different paths. One's wide and broad, and people are happy and just go lucky, and the other one's narrow and it's straight and it's difficult. So we as Christians have to choose that path, and when we look at what Satan does, and so what Jude says in verse 11, he starts with woe to them. Who's he talking to there to when he says woe to them? In Jude 11, who's he talking to when he says woe to them? Who's he referring to? The false teachers, exactly. He's talking about the false teachers. Now we can apply that to us too, but what he says here, woe to them, because they're trying to lead people off to the wrong path. They're trying to, to change what's right. They're trying to make little, little changes here or there, so he's woe to them. And we can look at, in, in, uh, from, from a, what do you think of when you think of, as it's written in the scripture, what does woe mean? Herschel, many years of preaching, what does, when you preach a sermon, if you use woe, what, what are you trying to do? What's woe mean in the scripture? Okay, it, it, it's, it's going to, you're trying to stop them from, from, it's leading, the way they're headed now, it's to destruction. It's a warning. It's a warning. <clears throat> so we, we look at the word, word woe as a warning. It's, it's used in scripture 71 times in the Old Testament in 69 verses in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's used 40 times in, in 33 verses. Jesus so, said woe. 32 times, and, when he, and we can look at some different verses, but if you look at Matthew chapter 23, there are many woes there, but who is he speaking to when he talks about woe in Matthew 23? Yeah, he's talking to religious people, the scribes and Pharisees, and he's telling them woe because he's talking about all the things that they do, where they're taking advantage of widows and just all the bad things that they're doing, and he's saying to them, woe to you. Woe to you. And so we have to think that there's probably times where our eldership needs to say to us, woe to you, if they see us going on a path that's not leading in the right way. If I'm a Christian and I'm erring, if all of a sudden my attendance falls off, then the warning should be, woe to you. Ned, you need to be back to church. That, you know, that's a warning. That, that's the path that they're headed on is the wrong path. And that's what Jude uses here to kind of to wake them up is woe to them because they're leading on the wrong path, the path to destruction. But we can look at, in Isaiah chapter 5, there's seven woes that's used. Um, Jesus used, in uh, Luke chapter 6, <clears throat> he has three woes there. So every time Jesus uses woe, it's in the same way, where he's trying to warn someone because of the way that they're headed, and it's not right. Has parents warned children, telling our children, whoa, slow down, going the wrong way? Yeah, probably a few times. So Jude tries to alert his readers to beware of the devil's tactics. Christians must choose carefully which road they will travel in life. 
to seize their attention and help them comprehend the peril of the picking the wrong path, Jude began his, ab his ab 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 abination with woe. And woe is an arresting, heart-stopping word. And then Jesus used it, we can look at, we won't, but we can look at Luke chapter 11, verses 21 through 24. And there he talks about three cities who witnessed what Jesus did, and yet they didn't, they rejected him. <clears throat> and he told them that Sodom and Gomorrah, or the cities of Tyre, would be better off than them because they saw what Jesus did and still rejected and so he used woe there also. <clears throat> now, he says the term that we're going to look at tonight and spend time on then is the way of Cain. What's the way of Cain? First of all, let's look at who, who was Cain? Okay. He was the very first person born as far as Abraham, Adam and Eve were formed. So Cain was the first son that was born of Eve. And um, so we, we can turn to Genesis chapter 4, and we can see the story of Cain and Abel. And Cain was the f first son, and then Abel. Now we know that they both offered sacrifices to God. And Cain offered, let's just turn to Genesis chapter 4. So in Genesis chapter 4, we find, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bare again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. <clears throat> and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground of the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desires for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength for you, a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So we have Cain and Abel. We don't have a lot. We just know that Cain was the oldest. Now, some of the commentaries and things that I read, uh, some people thought that because of what happened in the Garden of Eden and what God said to Satan, that Eve might have thought that when they had their first son, that this is who God talked about going to bruise Satan's heel, that possibly Cain might have been a little bit, and this is just possibility that Cain might have been a little bit more um, uh, loving or loved by his mother and, and then Abel was just the other child. We don't, all we know is that Cain offered a sacrifice, offered an offering, and um, we know that we can look at Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4 it tells us that by faith, he, Hebrews 11, 4, what did I say? I said Hebrews 4. Okay, Hebrews 11, verse 4, says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, to which he, which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and through it he being dead still speaks. 
And then we know that in Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we take those two verses, we have to believe that God at least had given them verbally how they were to make an offering. And there would have had to been, as God being a just God, for one to be acceptable and not acceptable, then there had to be a, a way to do it so that Cain's wasn't as, as, uh, wasn't as accepted because it wasn't the way it should have been. So we find here an example of uh, what usually happens when someone tells a lie. When, when somebody tells a lie, what usually happens? They've got to tell another lie and another lie. So a little one starts and we have a whole snowball effect. And, and that's kind of what the example of Cain is here. There's a sin, but then there's a sin to cover it up. Because what does he say to God? When God says, where's Cain? Where, where's your brother? Where's Abel? Where's your brother? He says, I don't know. So, you know, he murders his brother. He tells God that he doesn't know where he is, which he does. And then he says, which is probably one of the, the lines that everybody knows in the Bible is, am I my brother's keeper? Even if they don't know scripture, they know that term, that reference, am I my brother's keeper? And so we see Cain um, has anger. He, he's, he gets angry. It, God can see it in, in his countenance. Do any of us do that? Can, can people tell when we get angry? When we get upset? Or are we just eat cool all the time? Just... Yeah, people get out of control. People, and, and physically, people get angry, and can it, for those in the, the medical profession, does that have a bearing on your health? Absolutely, it does. Where do ulcers come from? Stress. And so, when, when we think about anger, and, and what, now, number one, is it wrong to be angry? No. No, it's not. I mean, we can see examples that of, of but, but what's, the, what's the guidelines in anger? Be angry, be angry and sin not, and not let the sun go down in your wrath. Because basically what happens is people have a tendency to harbor things, don't they? They, they can't hang on to things. And they can bring those things back up years later even, even years later of something that, that you did or didn't do. Or, but, so anger, the, the result of Cain killing Abel was jealousy and it was anger. And he was angry. He was angry because God accepted his brother's offering and not his own. Did Cain probably put forth the effort that was required? Probably not. We don't know for sure whether he was to give a blood offering as well or whether it was supposed to be of his best. We don't know, but we know it wasn't accepted as much as Abel's. Um, so we, we, we can learn part of the way of Cain is that the effect of anger and what anger does to people. Uh, in the, in, I assume it's in the, the USA, three to four million spouses are abused physically annually. Three to four million are abused. Now think about husband and wives and what that relationship should be, but how people can get to the point to where they physically abuse should be a loved one. Um, so anger is, anger is bad. Anger is from Satan. So when you talk about paths that we're on, we have to learn to be able to control our emotions, especially in regards to anger, because while it's easy to just fly off the handle, is it easy to take back anything we say? Because what happens when you said something? It's out there. You can't take it back. You can apologize, you can buy flowers or gifts or take them to lunch or do something, but when you say something, it's, it's there. And most times when we say things in anger, it's not, probably not things that we should be saying. So, uh, especially as Christians, when people watch us at work, uh, I know where I've worked for years, 
People watch you to try to catch you when you do get upset to see if you say a cuss word. That's what they listen for. Because when you, when you don't do that, they watch for it. And if you say anything close to it, they think that you did. So it's important that as Christians, when, when we profess to be Christians, that path we choose is our demeanor all the time. We talked about it last week. We're a Christian 24-7. We're a Christian. We're never off of being a Christian. And we never know who's watching us, who watches us for, and we influence. So definitely people that we work with or that, we, that we're social with who know where we stand, and they see us in a situation where it could be uh, an anger situation, how we react is important. And it speaks loudly, good or bad, of how we do. So we see the results of what Cain did and how Cain acted. So when we first look at the way of Cain, um, a lot of times in Scripture when it refers to way, it refers to the course of a, the way is a, the course of a person's life how they chose, which way they, which way they went down, what path they chose. Um, when we talk about self-will, it says, Cain was the older of two sons in the earth's first, first family. His brother Abel loved animals and chose shepherding as his life's occupation. Cain followed in the steps of his father and became a farmer. And we can see Gen- Genesis 4.2, and then we can see Genesis 2.15. The way of Cain first came to light when he and his brother were making offerings to God. And we just read that. Abel sacrificed the best of his flock, and the Lord received his gift with favor. Cain brought some some of the produce that he had grown, but God would not accept it. The difference between the two offerings was noted in the New Testament by Hebrews, and we read that. So so think about that offering. What's our our opportunity as Christians from an offering side? What can we do? What do we do on the first day of the week, each Lord's Day? We offer. We give our offering. I mean, physically, we actually give an offering. We give back to the Lord as we've been prospered. Now think about how you do that each week. If you do that each week, I guess is the first thing I should say, but if, if you do that as commanded, how are you making your offering? Are you offering like Abel? where you were prepared and you gave of, of, of your means the best? Or are you more like Cain, where you just kind of, oh, it's offering time, what do I have? And if you have enough to, the, to get through the week, then you'll, you'll give. We have an opportunity every week to prove our offering to God. No one else knows it's between you and God, but just like this with Cain and Abel, did Cain think that there was repercussions to his offering? Probably not. We, we don't know how often that they, they gave this offering. Uh, maybe some Bible-wise person could tell us, but I don't know if it was something they did annually. If they, but um, obviously Cain didn't put a lot of thought into it, where Abel did. And so we, as Christians, we have a way, the way we set in our lives, the path we choose, is the way we give back. And we should think about how we give back and how we prepare for that, and are we doing our best? Are we like Cain in that regard, or are we like Abel in that regard? Because there is a difference. Any comments at this point? Okay. How you, everything, your life. So when we think about a road less traveled in the path that we choose, obviously whenever we think about choices, we can go to Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24 verses 14 and 15, 
where there basically Joshua says, choose you the path, but as for me and my household, we're, we choose the Lord. So each of us have a choice to make in the path that we choose, and um, we need to make sure we choose the right path because there are repercussions with the path that we choose, and um, sometimes we can be diverted to a different path, but we need to get back to the path. So we can fall away, but we need to be back on the path. Um, Cain didn't take that opportunity. We don't know anything else about, I mean, we, we know a little bit about Cain, but we don't see anything where he turned himself around and, and did great things. Um, but we as Christians, as long as, as long as we still have breath, if we choose a different path and we wake up, we can come back to the, to the right path. When we look at Cain, one of the, some of the things that were referenced, the first, he was the first child of the fall. Uh, he was the first specimen, specimen of an unbelieving man. So when we think about the things that he did, one of it was unbelief. And he was the first example of apostasy. He's the first person that turned his back on God. Because he did know what was required. He chose not to do that. Now, I don't know where Adam and Eve, where, where they were when they were out of the garden, if, if they were still in sight of the garden, but when it, Cain and Abel were born, they knew what, um, no doubt, what got their parents in the position that they were in, and so they knew that there was a God. We, we, they knew God created, and so Cain had the knowledge of God, and he chose to um, step aside from it. What Jude's talking about with false teachers is those are people who were Christians who came in to um, create uh, distraction in the church. And so we have to make sure that we stay on the right path. When we talk about anger and we talk about um, words that we say, in Psalms, the 57th chapter, Psalms 57, Verse 4 tells us that our words, my soul is among lions, I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. What does that mean, their tongue is a sharp sword? Their words cut. Their words cut, exactly. Um, and I didn't watch the video, but I know there's a video currently out there with a young boy about bullying where his mom, um, I guess, is big on Facebook and it was on the news. I didn't really watch it, so I just heard it in passing. But we have a problem in our society with bullying, do we not? And think about when people choose that path, that a child, if a child acts that way, where do you think they picked that up? From their parents, probably. Right? So it's important when we think about the, how we live our lives and what we do. And when I said earlier, we don't know who we're influencing, who we're watching. As parents, we have eyes that watch and listen to everything we say and do. And probably most of these kids who are bullying a, a child like that probably have parents who, who act some way or people in their, their circle that act that way, that they see that. And that's a society that we live in where people, and when you think of, of Psalm, what David wrote, and words are like a sword. They are, they are cut. They cut into people. Uh, we see people with suicide because of bullying. I mean, it's just our society has gotten so brash that we don't think about other people. So Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. Now think about if, if our nation, if our society went by this. So listen to this. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who is stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, 
that he might have something to give him who has need. Let no one corrupt word, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now think about our nation. If President Trump got up tomorrow and said... This is what we're going to do as a nation. This is now our, this is our golden rule. Think about if people did that. If they really, no bad stuff coming out of the mouth. I mean, that, if you turn the TV on, on the news, what do you get? I mean, this, this is the opposite of that. Is what's fed into our society, into our world. That if we then, if each one of us said, okay, I'm not going to be that person. No, it, it doesn't say... Let some corrupt words creep out. It says, let no. No corrupt words. Escape from our mouths. I mean, it's, we need to control anger. And it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ. And then we can look at 1 Peter 3, 8, 9, kind of the same thing. But wouldn't it be nice if that's the world that we lived in? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Is that kind of what Fort Hill is, Bill? Fort Hill, is that kind of how we are at Fort Hill when we do, we escape all the world, we don't have the news on? People are pretty much, kind. they're kind to one another, they're tenderhearted, they're forgiving one another. So when we're at camp, when we're away from all the distractions of the world, it's easier to be a good, faithful Christian. It's when we we get uh, entangled back in the world and we let the world entangle in us, that those things creep in. So we have to choose the path. So the way of Cain was to, to, he worshiped God with impure motives. He did worship God because he did make an offering, but it wasn't accurate. What happens in the world today in, in most religious, on a Sunday, how many people are doing just that? They don't have the right motives when they're, when they're worshiping God. Probably the majority. Of, of what's out there today. Um, he, he had a heart filled with jealousy, envy, and hatred. And again, we don't have the whole picture of Cain and Abel, but we do know that obviously there was, there was hatred there, there was jealousy. Um, obviously, Abel offered was, was God's favorite at that time, and Cain reacted in an in a anger way, which then created, caused uh, murder. And then he lied about what he did. Uh, when asked when he was confronted with it. So, is our worship that we do, is it designed to please man or God? Think about how you, when you come to worship, are you coming to please the elders, the, your, your fellow brothers and sisters, or are you here to please God? And we're here to please God, right? So uh, when we come to worship, we're to come to, for our own edification, as well as building up one another is what we're commanded to do. So when we worship, our worship needs to be designed to please God and not man. So we're not putting on a show to be seen by people. We're basically worshiping God uh, as best we can, the best of our ability. I'm sorry? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, so Cain did what he wanted to do and not what God wanted. And and that's what we need. And and we have an example of how Christ wants us to worship, and that's what we're to follow. And and when man says, well, no, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it this way. that's That's where things go wrong. We have the plan here. We have to follow it. In Matthew chapter 7, 
I think we have a picture there of a bit of the judgment, but in Matthew chapter 7, when we talk about the worship, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, there are many people, there are many ways that people think that they can worship, but it's not right. If it's not as, as the pattern that's in the Bible, then it's wrong. Nothing makes it right by anybody else making a statement. If it's not what's here, then it's wrong. And I think this verse tells us that there are many people that, and when, when you think about here how it's talking about, didn't I prophesy in your name? And to me, prophesying in your name is the same thing as, didn't I preach? Didn't I preach? Da, 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 da. Didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? And uh, what the Lord says is, depart from I didn't know you. So if they're, not, if they're not worshiping right, if we're not worshiping right, then the Lord doesn't know us. And there are many in the world today that aren't worshiping right, and their worship is in vain. Right. And that's why our worship is trying, we try to do our worship in, in spirit and truth and we, in an orderly fashion. We, we try to do it so that uh, it doesn't come off as just thrown together without thought. And Mark doesn't just get up and preach with what hit him in the two minutes before he walks up. He walk, comes up prepared. You know, the song leader comes up prepared. Pray, you know, whenever, when we're participating in worship, we're to do our best and, and put uh, our best. What Abel, I mean, again, think of Cain and Abel and how we worship. Are we worshiping like Cain and just throwing it together? And just doing whatever. You know, well, I really wasn't paying attention today because I had this and this and this on my mind. Is there any excuses that we can have for not worshiping right? No, no sir. No, we, there's no excuses that we can have because we don't worship right. When we come here to worship God, we have to worship God as, as directed here. And um, you'll hear people say, well, I didn't, wasn't in the right frame. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be in the right frame. If you can't get in the right frame of mind here, then there's something wrong, because that's what we're supposed to do here. That's why we come, is to build up one another. And that's what our singing does, and, and that's what this, the, the worship does, is help to bring us together. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, there is the way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So think about that. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You know, I talked about it last week, how uh, non-religious religious people will, will write their books and ask for money and talk about how God told them to do, and, and those are ways of man. Those are ways of man who do those things for themselves, and they lead to death. So when we think about the way of Cain and, and how Jude's reference in that there to us as Christians is, is woe to the false teachers, but we could do it for us. Woe to Christians. Don't go the way of Cain. Control your anger. It's okay to be angry, but sin not. Let not the sun go down in your wrath. Don't harbor. I mean, it's today and it's over. Today's whatever bad, we forget it, we move on. Anger is something that can, can kill. I mean, heart attacks, it's, we, I talked about ulcers, but strokes and just, so anger is the way of Satan. If we're Christians, do you think we have the example of Jesus, when was he angry? Yeah, the money changers. Do we have any other example of Jesus being angry? other than the money changers? I mean, think about how if you were, a, let's say, a parent, and you tell your kids, stay right here, stay awake, and I'll, I'll be back in the night, and you come back and they're sleeping. 
how would you react? Frustrated, and then you'd say, now I'm coming back, stay awake, because, and you go back. Did God, did Jesus get angry with the apostles then? No, but how easy it would be for us to be angry in a situation like that. So we have Christ as a perfect example for us, and he tells us that we can be angry, but don't let the sun go down on our wrath. Don't let our anger control us, which is what the way of Cain. Look at what the effect of his anger did for the rest of his life, for his family, because of that one act while in anger. Jealousy and all those things that, that were involved, that controlled his life, and that act of anger, the, the price that they pay. Yeah. Mark 45? And what's that regarding? Okay. By the, far, far, by the way they reacted to how he, because he healed, he was angry with them? Okay. Okay, so Christ was angry, but he didn't sin. And we could do the same thing. Okay, thank you for your time and your attention.